Okay, so uh, today um, I want to go over um, what I didn't cover last time about reinforcement learning, Q learning. There's just a few nodes left. Um, then, uh, hi everybody out there. I've got question and answers turned on. So, um, whoever's, uh, we have zero viewers. Anyways, if anybody's <laughs> watching online, feel free to uh, chime in and say something. Um, so we're going to cover the um, last few nodes of, uh, of, uh, of Q-learning, uh, and then I'm going to cover the uh, project that's due next. Um, I have a, a abbreviated sort of draft version uh, of that project uh, on, on, the, on the wiki, um, but there's not many details there, so I'll actually go through verbally what the details are um, with you guys uh, right here. Um, okay, so let's go to let's look at the um, the last few notes here. Oh, I should share my screen so that online people can see this. Oh, we have one viewer. Hey, viewer! <laughs> Everybody say hi to the viewer. Uh, hey, okay, all right. <clears throat> Three viewers now. All right. I just lost up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we ended last time where I was talking about discretization. Uh, so the the way that works into um, the, your project is you're going to select uh, three or four technical indicators uh, to use as part of your. Uh, as part of your reinforcement learning algorithm for trading. Um, and those factors, uh, along with am I holding the stock or not, um, and how much uh, return have I gained since I held the stock, will describe your state. So remember, remember that uh, given a state, you need to select an action. So the state is going to be, be comprised of at least four, maybe five different factors that uh, you're going to create. Does everybody follow that? And then you need to convert that into a single number, an integer, that you can then index your Q table with. Um, so uh, recapping a little bit, uh, for each state, there's a number of potential actions. And in our case, the actions are buy, sell, do nothing. So just three actions. And your Q table should reflect the value for that particular state taking each one of those actions. And you pick the um, action that provides the best value, right? This uh, is a, uh, an example of how to convert those different factors that you've got uh, into that single number. Um, now, uh, one thing I've done here is I've got four factors and I've reserved an entire digit uh, for each factor. Um, but you can, you can be smarter than that. So for instance, um, am I holding the stock or not is only a zero or a one. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to cover the detail here, but I'm sure you could imagine uh, more creative ways to create this number uh, uh, more simply. Um, it becomes important, um, so if you're using an entire digit or just a single bit like that, um, and you've got lots of factors, suddenly, you know, here instead of uh, uh, 10,000 states, 
you may easily have millions of states. Um, and the negative aspect of having millions of states is it takes a lot longer for your learner to experience all of them and learn from them. So you should be uh, thinking about how to make this number um, smaller. Okay, any, any, any questions um, here? Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, even if the state, the number of states is very large, is it necessary that we visit all the states, right? Um, so um, it, it's often the case that in actual practice, um, Okay, let me back up a little bit. The, the states that you experience, uh, or your learner experiences, um, are driven by a couple different things. Uh, one of them is uh, for the data you're looking at and the, um, the values of the factors that you computed. Uh, maybe there's just some corner of the space that, you know, maybe IBM never has a Bollinger value of two. And you've anticipated that in the description of your state space, but IBM just never goes there. Um, so that's beyond uh, that's beyond your control, um, or beyond the control of the learner at least. So uh, part of the part of the issue about how much of the state space you visit has to do with just the world and the data that you have. Uh, the other, though, can be driven a bit by the actions that are selected. So if, um, you know, let's say um, we're programming a robot to navigate and all it ever does is turn right, um, it may never experience some of the states that are off to the left. Um, uh, and let's say, bringing it back to trading, let's say all you ever do is buy. <laughs> um, you're not experiencing what happens if you sell. So um, to force uh, the system to experience uh, the system to experience more states, you want to select. Uh, you want to at the beginning at least to select actions randomly, um, and that will force uh, exploration. But still, it is very likely uh, that there will be parts of the state space that you just can't ever get to, um, and that that's kind of beyond your your control. Yeah. Um, it's uh, I'm trying to think of the right next right um, word for it. Um, it there, there's an acronym that, that equates to I made it up, but it has to do with parts of anatomy. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, I didn't just make it up, but uh, uh, in my ex experience, when you read papers about um, people um, who have investigated this, a, a typical starting value is about 0.3. But uh, there's no, I don't think there's any theoretical result about what an appropriate value is there. Uh, but that's, in, in my research, uh, that, that's a number that I start with. Uh, and, and then, you know, it decays over time, the probability of, that you'll, you'll pick something randomly. Um, but I don't have a good, uh, a strong basis for why that's a good number. I think um, from the point of view of Q learning's uh, theoretical results, um, they depend, uh, so there's, to, to delve into the theory a little bit, um, Q learning is guaranteed to converge to an optimal policy um, if the, um, the Markov process you're learning about is stationary and ergodic. So uh, what those two things, so stationary means that the probabilities don't change over time. Uh, so if, you know, so the, you know, the, the states are connected with different probabilities of what state you'll end up uh, after action. If it's stationary, those probabilities don't change. Uh, ergodic means that um, all, if, if you imagine each of the states is like a node and a graph, um, and the transitions between them are when you take an action, you move from one state to another. Um, if all states are reachable, 
um, from every other state uh, than, uh, than it's ergodic. Um, so what you're saying, like you might not reach all the states, what happens if you're like actually running in, in a testing phase and come against the state you haven't previously trained against? Um, <clears throat> so the, the question for people online, uh, what if uh, you're in the testing phase now and you encounter a state that you haven't um, seen in training, what do you do? So um, the um, uh, just so we go strictly by, you know, what the policy is for Q learning. Uh, you, you come to a state you haven't been to. Uh, you look at the Q table for that state, and there's some there's some number in there for each action. Uh, you might have initial, and it depends on how you initialize them. So you might have initialized them uh, with small random numbers, uh, in which case you'll just end up somewhat randomly choosing an action based on the small random numbers. You might have initialized it uh, with, say, all zeros. And depending on your whatever your code is for iterating through them, you know, you probably have some little bit of code that says some little for loop where you step through each one and see which one is the largest, and you just remember which one that is. Probably you would end up choosing the first action if that's what you were doing. Uh, finally, one other possibility is uh, you will end up choosing a random action because of that we were talking early earlier. There's some uh, some chance you'll choose a random action. Um, there, people have gotten dissertations about what to do in that case. So what what we're going to do is. Um, uh, uh, not worry about it too much, I think, is the, <laughs> is the main thing. Um, now, um, in when you're training your system, uh, what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a time period. Um, and you'll step through each date over that time period and update your queue table you know, as you experience it through time. Uh, after you go through, through, the set, through that time once, you will have a policy. It might not be, it might not have experienced all the states. It's probably not complete, but you've got a policy and you can back test it. Um, so you'll back test it um, over that same time period, or you know, in sample, and you'll note um, what was the return. Uh, then you'll um, iterate again over that same time period, retrain, well, provide additional information to your Q table. Um, back test that, compare it to the last one. And what you should see is that uh, each time you iterate through all that data, your back test should improve a little bit. And over time, it's going to improve, 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 and eventually it'll stop improving. And once uh, you go through one or two back tests with the same result, you'll say, OK, I've converged. It's as good as it's going to get. That's my policy. Um, uh, it, it's very likely you haven't um, tested all the states. Um, but now you can back test it on a following year and see how well it works. Um, what happens in reality when you do that is um, you're very likely now in this succeeding year to encounter states that you haven't seen before. So you'll want to continue learning. Um, uh, but when you spend all this time training your learner here, um, you've converged to something you're ready to take out to, you know, to the real world, and but you continue to learn as you as you go forward there. Um, any other questions? Let's see if we have any online questions. Um, sorry. Uh, Okay, uh, no questions. Yeah. Yes, yes, so, but I thought when you were um, by whatever the rules of machine learning stuff, then when you're doing a testing phase, you should be using that for the training. Otherwise, you're going to be some still getting on. Um, yeah, so um, you, you have training data, um, but you want to make full use of, well, I'm not certain what you're asking, but what I think you're asking is, um, uh, 
that I was describing doing in sample testing. I mean, the part we said, so we test it next year, and you're going to see some states you have an kind of report. Right. But basically, try to use that information to continue to update your. Right. Report. But then, isn't that using testing data essentially in some sense for trying um, As long as you are. So, by the way, for the um, project, uh, I'm going to have you freeze the policy you learned in this year and you know, essentially turn off learning and then try it in the subsequent year. But um, just because it gets too complicated to, uh, I mean, it gets hard to grade. <laughs> so I just want to make it simple. You train over this year and uh, start to test, you know, you test over here. Um, anyways, his, his question was, um, uh, when you're in that subsequent year, um, isn't letting and learn uh, cheating in some sense? It's not cheating if, as you step forward in time, uh, you see something new, you update your queue table, but uh, you don't get to retry back here. Um, you only get to use the benefit of that knowledge for trading going forward after that. Um, so you can pretend like that subsequent year is real life um, and you never, you're, you're never allowed to go back. But you can say, hey, I haven't seen this state before, let me update my Q table with that information. Okay, any, um, see if we have any questions uh, from the online folks. Um, okay, logically it seems reward will be daily return. Are there any cases where it uh, should, would be different? Um, I, I'm recommending uh, daily return as, as a reward. Uh, it remains to be seen whether um, delayed return, in other words, when you uh, enter and you wait to see the return until you exit, uh, that's, that's potentially a, a good training, a good reward signal as well, but it'll take longer to converge. Okay, let's go to the next node. Discretization or discretizing. Let me say, who's talking in the back? No. Okay. So let's suppose um, uh, we have this data, and uh, what I'm trying to show, and I, I realize it might be hard to see, is um, uh, the data is, we've got a lot of examples between 0 and uh, 25. And in this zone, it's kind of dense. There's a lot of points uh, in this region. Uh, this is kind of a sparse area. This is kind of sparse, and so on. Um, anyways, uh, looking real quickly back to the previous slide, um, if you note, we, um, we had sort of a customize module for discretizing each of our factors. So this next step is talking about, okay, how do we, uh, what does that little module look like? So this is one way that you could build it. Uh, there's, there's many, um, many ways you might do it. This is, this is an example. Um, the, the, the method that I'm recommending is, uh, first of all, you um, decide ahead of time how many different um, discrete values do you want. 10 is a typical number, you know, why? Because we have 10 figures. Um, uh, I, I don't have a better reason other than that. Um, uh, however, it's, it's typically something you want to experiment with. So you might start for each factor having 10 discrete factors, see how well your learner works. Um, the, the more factors you have, the larger your state space and potentially uh, the longer it's going to take for your system to converge. Also, um, you know, let, let, let's say you picked a hundred, you know, for a particular factor, you, you picked a, you were going to have a hundred discrete values. It's much more likely now that you're going to have unvisited states in your state space. Um, because what's the chance that you'll get exactly that same value in, in, uh, in reality? Um, so, 
my recommendation is typically to start with a fairly small number of discrete values, um, see how well your system works, and then uh, consider uh, ramping it up. Uh, and and it, may, it may make sense that for some factors you have a small number of discrete values and for others you have a larger number. But anyways, once you know how many discrete steps you want, um, this is a fairly uh, simple algorithm for, essentially you have to have thresholds that say, okay, if the, um, if the value is between this one and that one, then the discrete number is one, if it's between this one and that one, it's two, and so on. And here's a simple way of determining what those thresholds ought to be. Uh, so first, um, you look at how many data items you have, and you divide that by how many steps you've got. Uh, then you sort your data, um, then you um, step uh, through the number of steps you've got and just set the threshold according to, you know, let's say, let's say we had 100 data items and we're going to have 10 steps. The threshold of, uh, of at zero is just um, uh, zero plus one, which is one, times step size, which would be 10. So we're just going to find the threshold at this 10th value. And then the next one, and the next one, and so on. So if we, if we sort of flesh it all the way out, we just end up finding these uh, individual thresholds. We just look directly at the values, and those end up being what the thresholds are. So when we're going to, um, when we have a, so this, you, you do this on your um, training data, and when you're at the point of testing, you just uh, say, okay, I've got a new value coming in. Um, where does it fall between these thresholds? If it's over here, okay, it's discretized value, discretized value is nine. If it's over here, it's discretized value is eight, and so on. So that's just a basic, simple um, uh, discretization uh, method. Now, when you're training your system, remember I said you're gonna, I'm gonna give you a certain year to work over. Um, what you should do is go through that whole year and look at um, what the values for your factors are over that whole year, and then you can use this algorithm to, to slice it up. You have to remember those values when you go into the next year, um, so that as you experience those uh, going forward, you know, um, you know what, the, what the numbers are. Any questions on that? Yeah. Is there a reason you're using custom styles instead of uh, chopping it in a regular quantity? Um, so, uh, so the question was: Is there a reason I was I'm slicing it into essentially percentiles uh, as opposed to sort of like regular intervals? So, um, let's. Uh, Yes, there is. So let me, that's a good question. Uh, so let's suppose our data, well, let's suppose our data, just for discussion purposes, ranges from 0 to 100. We might naturally say, okay, let's just use as our thresholds 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, you know, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the problem with that is um, it may turn out to be the case that uh, in reality there's very few times a number comes up between 0 and 10, but a lot of times it comes up between 40 and 50. Like most of the data might be concentrated between 40 and 50. So if, um, uh, if we do it the way I'm recommending, you'll have a bunch of little slices between 40 and 50 to help you discriminate uh, between those commonly occurring values. Whereas if you just use sort of fixed numbers, um, most of the times it would come up four, um, and you wouldn't have the ability to discriminate between the, the, the finer numbers there. Um, but again, this is this is um, uh, this is something that people spend lots of time. Uh, you know, there's PhD dissertations about how to how to discretize data. Even I'm just throwing out an example to to start with. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so that's um, discretization.
So let's um, let's recap um, uh, Q learning overall. So um, you start by defining what are your states, and again, um, what we're going to use for that are some technical features. You know, certainly um, all under value, but uh, you can choose um, others that you want to use. You need to define actions. We're going to use buy, sell, or do nothing, and rewards. And uh, my recommendation and what we should go with is uh, daily return is going to be the, uh, the immediate reward. So once you have those defined, uh, you've essentially turned the trading problem uh, into a reinforcement learning problem, and we can apply Q learning to that problem. Uh, next, you choose that period you're going to sample, or I'm sorry, that you're going to train on, and you go through it. Um, and at the end of that, you have a Q table. You back test your Q table. You go through it again. Uh, keep going through it, and remember, you have to go through it in sequence. Um, and each time you back test your policy, note how well it did, and you keep repeating this until. Uh, performance stops getting better. Um, once it stops getting better, you've got your policy. Uh, now we carry it forward and test it on testing data. OK, so that is it for um, uh, uh, Q learning. The next uh, reinforcement learning uh, centric lesson is called Dyna. I'll, I'll answer your question in a second. The the so here's the here's at least one problem with Q learning is uh, e each time you interact with the world, you get information that you can use to update the Q table. But consider um, consider that you know this. Inter well, let me put it. Let me turn that around a little bit. The only time you can update the Q table is when you interact with the real world. And let's suppose um, let's suppose you're working at a hedge fund, and you say, "Ooh, ooh, I want to do Q learning." Um, and so your boss says, "Okay, cool. Well, how are you going to get um, data to train your um, Q learner?" And you say, "Look, just give me a hundred million dollars, and I'll trade it." And see what happens, and I'll use that data to train my Q learner. Um, uh, sounds pretty good, right? Um, I, they'll say, "Absolutely, let's do it." Um, so um, the point I'm trying to make is that experience is expensive, right? And uh, one issue about Q learning is uh, when you get that experience tuple, you only update one part of the Q table, um, even though that result um, uh, really ought to percolate to other parts of the Q table. Um, and uh, uh, Dyna is about making more efficient use of real experience so that you, you can essentially converge to a um, stable policy with uh, fewer uh, training examples. Um, and it's the same in almost any uh, any place that reinforcement learning is used. It's the same case where um, interaction with the world is expensive, um, and you want to somehow figure out how to, once you have that interaction, uh, converge to a policy more quickly. Um, and that's what that's what Dyna is about. Okay, let's see if we. Uh, so we had a question over here. Yeah. Uh, in the discretization problem, how do you decide the number of thresholds that you're going to place? So the, um, the question is in the um, discretization step, how do you decide how many individual thresholds to have? Um, the, um, I don't have a principled answer for you. Um, I, I think a, um, uh, a way that I would uh, go about it is, um, first of all, um, look at the distribution of the data itself. Um, that may be um, informative. Um, 
The, the next thing is um, experiment. Uh, start with a um, small number of discrete values. And if that works well, so the advantage for with a small number of discrete values is it allows for uh, easily more more easy um, generalization. So if it's low, you should always do this. If it's high, you should always do this. If it's in the middle, do this. So you know three <laughs> is a good starting point. Um, but uh, uh, if if things are not working well, you can try turning that number up or turning it, it down. Uh, but I don't have a quick and easy solution to what you know what the correct number is. Um, all right, let's see if we have any um, online questions. Um, so there, there's a question about um, uh, uh, I'm talking about Q learning, um, but that's different than what the project is about. So I'm getting to the project now. The, the reason I talked about Q-learning here is because uh, we had a few, um, I didn't quite finish up on campus the, the last um, lecture. Okay, here is now an overview for the next project. Um, and this is draft, uh, uh, the, we'll have a, a, hopefully a final version out uh, tonight. Um, and this is due, um, uh, in 2015, it's due November 30th. The reason I'm saying 2015 is maybe next year somebody will be watching this video and they'll say, hey, you said it was due November 30th. Um, okay, 2015. Um, okay. The objective, okay, so forget about Q-learning now. We're back in the old world of KNN. Uh, you've built a KNN learn. Um, I want you now to use it to predict stock prices. Um, and that's what this project is about. So the, um, the first step uh, is you need to massage the data a little bit uh, so that you're predicting the right thing. And the particular data that um, uh, I'm going to have you look at is if, if, if you look within your data directory, there's a bunch of stock symbols in there, but there's a, a number of uh, examples with special, oh, I guess it's hard to see. A number of special ones that have names like ML4T-399. Um, and these are, in fact, I've got one right here. This is um, MLT399. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's a sine wave. So it looks like just um, all of the other files, it's got a, um, a date, an open, high, low, close, and uh, adjusted close. And you'll note that they're all the same. Um, but uh, you know, of course, it's got a clear pattern in it. And you should be able to. Um, easily, um, your, your learner should easily be able to um, forecast what's, what's going to happen. Um, so the idea is, you know, debug your learner here, um, and then you can trivially change out the name of this file for IBM or Google or whatever, and see, you know, try your hand at, um, uh, at real stock data. Um, so uh, there, there's a bunch of these examples. They all have, um, they're all sine waves. Um, but they, they have different um, average values and uh, ranges um, and different uh, um, periods and so on. So um, uh, you, you, can, you can try different sine waves. In fact, you can, what I think, what I'm going to suggest is that you learn, you apply your learner to several different uh, examples of these files, um, and you ought to be able to actually succeed at each one of them uh, independently. So that's what the data looks like. Um, the, um, the first step is for you to build the um, Y data to train on. So I'm going to take to the board now to talk about this.
Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna focus just on one symbol at a time for this, uh, but in uh, in real life you'd be doing this analysis on like all members of the S and P 500 at once. But uh, let's assume these are um, prices for things like IBM and Google and so on. And this column here are the historical prices for IBM. Now, you are going to decide which um, factors uh, you believe are useful for uh, predicting. So for example, um, Bollinger value. Momentum. Uh, if, if you go to um, uh, stockcharts.com, you can learn about uh, hundreds of technical indicators. But pick three, okay? Then take these historical prices and uh, map them to a new data frame with x1, x2, x3. Um, and these are arranged by time and so on. Okay, so that's, this, this is gonna be your X. What is Y? So, um, uh, I mentioned before, I'll say it again, uh, you don't want to predict a specific price because um, uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, one is it's unlikely that you're gonna come across exactly that price again. Uh, another is you want to generalize. So if you train on one or two stocks, you'd like to be able to um, use that model, say on other stocks. So if you, if you trained on Google, I don't know what the price of Google is now, but anyways, uh, uh, and if, if all the prices were in the range of 600 and suddenly you wanted to use that model for some very low price stock, all, it's, all your model's ever seen is these 600 numbers, so it'll start spitting out 600, which is totally wrong. So what do you want to do instead? You want to predict change in price. Okay? So here's how you do that. Um, uh, first, um, I'm going to call this Tim. You can uh, fill this in uh, initially with what the um, real prices were, but what you want to end up, um, uh, say, um, training this row for is how much did the price change um, five days into the future? So let's see, one, three, four, five. So um, you want to be predicting that. And so what you should do is fill this in with um, five day um, percent change. So what you want um, to end up with uh, right here in this row is how much did the price change from here to there? And for this one, how much did the price change from here to there and so on? So now your experienced tuple 
is what were the value of your factors and how much did the price change uh, five days into the future. Now this is peaking into the future big time, but um, we're allowed to do that um, in sample when we're training. Um, but this is probably the most, um, you know, the most important step is you're trying to predict something that happens in the future. You can only gather that information about the future if you go back historically in time and see what happened, right? And that's uh, that's how you do it. Any questions about about what that ought to be? Yeah. So if today's Monday. We want what the return would have been on Friday. Um, yeah, so the, the practical, um, let's see, uh, uh, no, um, next Monday. So it's close to close um, five days uh, um, in the future. Question in the back. So are we predicting the price on a difference day or are we predicting the difference in price between the current day and the future? You're predicting the difference in price between this day and five days later. So the um, so 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 let's say we're trying to fill in uh, y of t. So that should be um, uh, y. Well, let me call it. Let's call this y prime. Okay, or I'll call it. I'll, I'll, just trying to differentiate um, between what was before and what's now. So let's, let's use prices, okay? So y of t is equal to price of t plus 5. Divided by divided by price of t minus 1. So you just iterate. So uh, you know how much I hate for loops. But anyways, it's convenient to think about things as a for loop. You just iterate through these. Um, so these are prices, and this is y. And so this cell depends on that cell and that cell. And you plug in how much it actually changed. Now, I expect somebody to ask me, why five days? Does anybody wonder about that? No? One person. OK, cool. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, the answer is. Um, uh, it it doesn't it doesn't matter so much um, how many days into the future you want to to build your forecaster for, but you have to um, uh, you have to make a commitment before you can train your system. So uh, you just have to you have to pick a number, uh, train it, see how well it works. Um, now it it might make sense to experiment with different um, uh, distances into the future. Um, and see how well your forecaster works uh, for different periods into the future. But um, I don't know of a way to, um, uh, you know, simultaneously forecast different periods into the future and sort of on the fly choose which one you want to use. But if whatever number you pick, your learner is now going to be optimized for that period into the future. Um, okay. Yeah. Does your uh, like genetic algorithms that you use only help with choosing the features, or can it also help you with respect to time? Um, uh, repeat that again. Like the algorithms that you employ, my understanding is they help you decide oh. next one, next two, next three, throwing a You also use them to see. So, um, so his question is: um, At my company, Lucena, we've got some algorithms for picking features. Do we also have? Um, algorithms for picking uh, how far into the future. Um, uh, the, um, no. Um, I, um, 
And what we have done is uh, uh, built forecasters that predict uh, at different you know distances out into the future, and then looked at the correlation between uh, uh, predicted and actual, and uh, it ends up. Um, uh, so this is correlation. Uh, so a you know an all-star winner is like zero point one two. Um, if correlation between actual and, and predicted, um, and that's uh, that's at about like uh, one day. And as we extend it further, um, it uh, it drops. And it ends up being so. You can't really tell it, it, when it, once it once it gets down in the weeds, you know, around like 0.05 or so. It that's no different from random, really. Um, but anyways, long story short, um, uh, we our, our predictability seriously degrades when you start to get out to about uh, 20 days. Our best, um, our most successful forecasts are just. Uh, one day, um, what the um, what happens is when you you find features to predict one day returns, uh, it ends up converging to things that amount more or less to um, uh, news. You know, some kind of news comes out, big change over the next day or two, um, and uh, that's fine. Um, one, one problem, though, with such a short forecast is, um, let's say uh, you want to apply $100 million to that opportunity. Um, you can't buy $100 million worth of anything in one day without the price um, going totally against you. Um, so you want uh, forecasts that are useful over longer periods of time. Um, OK. Has anybody got a, um, a Mac PowerBook uh, charger device? Yeah. Can I borrow it? <laughs> Does this tell you what to sell? Huh? Does this give you a case of what you should sell? Like, are you just looking for five days oh. and selling it at the end of five days? Uh, really, thank you. Yeah. Is this the right type? Yes, good. Okay. So the um, question was, um, uh, does this give us an indication when to sell? Um, the answer is no. Um, and that's why, um, that's why we're doing reinforcement learning next, is because um, uh, this, this only forecasts a change. It doesn't, it doesn't give you a policy. It doesn't tell you what to do. Um, you're going to have to, on your own, say, you're going to have to develop your own policy based on this predicted change. So you'll presumably look for something like when the forecast change over five days is more than 2% buy, uh, and then just hold it for five days. Or you can have something fancier and say, I'll hold it until the price drops um, and you know, just track it going up, you know, whatever you like there. But you're going to have to create a policy based on just this forecast. Reinforcement learning uh, can tell you when to get in and when to get out, but regression can't. Um, okay, let me, um, okay, there's a couple questions here. Let me address them. Uh, oh, people want to see some girls again. Um, would bagging be applicable to these types of models? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but if you uh, have the forecast, doesn't everybody have it by the efficient markets hypothesis, or does this assume not everyone is applying these methods? Okay, so that's a great question. Let me repeat it. If you have the forecast, doesn't everyone uh, have it by the efficient markets hypothesis, or does this assume not everyone is applying these methods? So um, uh, if you, um, I haven't conducted this study, but I would really like for somebody to do it. Um, I have a hypothesis that Bollinger Bands 
worked great in 1985. I don't know exactly when Bollinger, um, you know, wrote about Bollinger bands, but I'll bet if you go back even before he wrote about them, they would really work well. Um, uh, later, once it came out and he started making a big deal about it, I'll bet the effectiveness of them decreased. And I think that for just about any technical indicator, you would probably see the same uh, uh, consequence that uh, initially, it probably worked decently, but eventually the um, effectiveness uh, evaporated. Uh, okay, so what to do? Well, um, uh, so first of all, a lot of these indicators actually uh, do work or did work and violated the efficient markets hypothesis. So I don't believe the efficient markets hypothesis, but I believe that it's harder to find inefficiencies. They're still out there, but they're in little corners. Um, and one place that they are is in judicious combination of indicators. So if you use just one indicator, probably it's not gonna work so well, but if you find several to connect together in a clever way, um, you will find, uh, you'll potentially find some inefficiency there that you can um, exploit. Um, just saying if we got any other questions here. Okay. Um, all right, so this, um, this is an important step in, in, the, in the project. Uh, one of the things I want you to um, plot, okay, the important thing to remember here is this is change in price, not price, okay? One thing I want you to plot is, um, okay, my, you know, whatever the, data is, and then I want you to um, superimpose on that uh, your forecast uh, change. Um, so remember, we're, um, let's say each one of these increments is uh, five days. Remember, we're wanting you to um, forecast um, five-day return. I want you to scale that Y appropriately so that it you know, matches the original um, uh, figure and plot it. And the kind of thing that um, I expect you, I expect to see is, um, let's see if I can draw it properly. Um, essentially just a shift, you know, back in time of, of what that curve looks like. That'll mean that um, you've created Y correctly. So blue is, so red here is Y and blue is crisis. Does it make sense to everybody? I just want you to, it's just a required step to make sure you're making the, the proper shift there. Okay. Um, the remaining things for you to do, and I'm running low on time, so I want to cycle through them. I want you to train your learner from uh, 2008 to the end of 2009, uh, and then using whatever trading policy you think makes sense, uh, to draw um, entry and exit lines just like we did for the Bollinger thing. So let's suppose your um, policy is when the forecast uh, change is greater than plus 2%, I'll buy. So you would probably have buy lines there. Um, need a black. Um, exit. Um, this is also a great time to short, right? Exit. 
a good time to buy, and so on. So these vertical lines indicating, you know, based on your forecaster, when you would uh, enter and exit. And this is uh, uh, in sample. So I then want you to um, back test that. So generate orders from this. And uh, I expect to see, you know, something that looks really fantastic, right? Because this is, you know, just strongly, strongly predictable. Um, then I want you to try it, but on real stock data. Um, and uh, train, train your system over 2008, 2009, but then uh, test it in uh, 2010. And it's going to suck. Okay, just telling you ahead of time. That's that's why when you when you try it with the sine wave, I want you to go yeah, okay, because when you try it on the real stock data, it's going to suck, and I don't want you to be sad. Um, but eventually, um, you can indeed uh, find success with real stock data. It just uh, it just takes persistence and you know exploring every nook and cranny. Okay, questions on uh, this this project? Probably better off training on a sine wave than you'd be training on an actual stock and then because I mean it down and then went up. So I feel like you'd be worse off training on stock and doing on a sine wave in this case. Um, uh, I think, well, uh, I'm not sure that was a question, but anyways, um, <laughs> I, I, I believe that um, if, if you train on a sine wave, you should be able to find buy and sell signals that would be, you know, uh, humongously productive. Um, one, uh, um, one thing, uh, uh, it'll probably be an extra credit, um, uh, but one thing that uh, I think is going to be very interesting is um, what will work better, KNN or linear regression? People say KNN. Yeah. So um, uh, we'll 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 test it. And remember, one of the reasons I had you write your learners in this modular way is boom, you can just test it, right? But here's why I think linear regression. Uh, has a pretty good chance of doing well. Um, so, of course, linear regression uh, finds linear models. Um, uh, but depending on which um, indicators you choose to build, uh, you're actually um, potentially creating nonlinear indicators. Um, uh, essentially, you are taking this nonlinear problem, and if you choose the right indicators, um, you're linearizing it. And we know that if we have an underlying linear problem, uh, linear regression can solve the heck out of it. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll have that as extra credit and people can experiment. Um, let me, um, so we're at the end of the period. Uh, let me see if we've got any um, Questions online, and I'll take any in-person questions. Uh, uh, online, if you have any questions, ask them now. I'll take an on-campus question. Any on-campus questions? Yeah, I have a question about your work as a student. Um, why do you think it's so hard to, you know, get some things that look like they should work in theory to work in practice? Um. So a uh, question from the audience here is um, uh, uh, we have these things that apparently should work in theory. How come they don't work in practice? Um, and uh, um, I asked this question actually of um, Michael Kearns once. So Michael Kearns is a well-known machine learning guy. Um, he uh, consults with big hedge funds. Uh, he had worked at um, Bear Stearns, I believe. 
anyways, um, now has most recently worked at the SAC Capital. He seems to pick companies that uh, either get convicted or um, bankrupt. I don't know why. Um, but uh, anyways, I asked him that question. And he said that um, the character of this problem, this machine learning problem, is different. It's much different, say, than computer vision. So you know, you point a camera at a giraffe or whatever, um, and the giraffe kind of sits there and you know relishes its giraffeness, um, uh, but it doesn't change. the The market. So, making analogy to um, a machine learning problem, it's like while you're trying to learn how to track giraffes, the giraffes change their appearance, um, or more specifically, the market is trying to defeat you. The market is changing. It notices what you're doing and adjusts to defeat you. And that's why that's why it's hard. People started making money with Bollinger Bands in the 80s. Um, other people, I mean, here's what happens. Other people said, ah, um, if I put a computer closer to the exchange and I predict the Bollinger Band a little bit faster, than that poor sucker in Atlanta, I'll buy the stock now and sell it to him when his computer finally realizes it's time to buy. And so all that compression sucks the um, juice out of, um, out of all these methods. Um, let's see if we have an online question. Okay, we've got a couple more. Um, I'll take, uh, so we've got a bunch of questions online. I'll, I'll address them one by one, then I'll let everybody go. Um, can I briefly restate what is on the left board? Um, the leftmost is off the camera. Okay. Here, I'll make it easy. It's just showing the data. Um, okay. Can we use regularization to improve our models? Well, regularization is is you take a look at the data, and instead of you know having it go from negative 1,000 to positive 250, um, you regularize it so it goes from negative 1 to 1. Um, yes, that's an important step. I hadn't covered it much, but um, uh, that, uh, that can make your learners work much better. Uh, some girls again. Um, OK, any other on-campus questions? OK, we'll let everybody go. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.